Glory, glory, glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Boy, that is just fantastic. That song is such a perfect, perfect song. And I, I don't know how they, they do it every week. Tanya, I don't know. She just, she just has a special connection with the Lord to, to know what's coming up and all of that. And I know a lot of times people say, boy, they, I know they have to get together and just plan all of these, all of the praise and the worship to go with what the message is about. But really, we don't. We, we, we really, uh, I work on message and Tanya works on music and, um, you know, and the Lord just puts it together. It just seems to be great, you know. And that's just a wonderful thing. And, and we're going to be, for the next five or six weeks or so, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about names. But it's not going to be different names of Jesus. It's going to be names of the enemy that we face. Now, I want you to know that I don't plan to glorify the enemy. This is not a, this is not a devil glorifying series. It's a God glorifying series because no matter, no matter what the devil is, no matter what he does, God gives us the power to overcome that. And we can overcome it through the name of Jesus and Jesus living in us and the Holy Spirit. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to take about five of, or six of the, of the most frequently used names of the, of the enemy in the scripture. I don't know if you're aware of this, but, but the Bible uses 33 different names for the enemy. And, and, um, and, and those names reflect a nature. So when the Bible uses a name, that name has a meaning and the meaning reflects a nature. And I'm just saying that if we can understand the nature of our enemy, then we can know how he's going to attack us. And if we can know how he's going to attack us, then we can be prepared for that because the Lord has promised to give us victory over, over every power of the enemy. And so let's see if maybe the Lord can teach us a few things about, about the enemy that we face. And, and to start with, I wanna just read you about mm, uh, three or four passages of scripture. And here's what I'd like for you to do. I'm reading this, of course, they'll be on the screen for you. But what, as I'm reading this, I want you to just kind of make a mental note uh, about uh, every time you hear the devil's name or some allusion to him or some, something that would reflect him, all right? I just, let's just, let me read this, and I'll, then I'll tell you why, I'm, why I did that. This is 1 Peter 5, 8, really great word. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Luke 10, then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Matthew 4. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you're the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, the reason that I ask you to take just a little mental note of every time you heard the devil's name or something that alluded to the work the devil does and is because according to a 2008 Barna Research Group, how many of you have ever heard of the Barna Research Group? You've heard that name? They're a, they're a Christian organization that for the last 30 or 40 years has done research among Christians to find out how Christian beliefs interact and intersect with, with the rest of the world. And so they're a real quality group. But back in 2008, and this is the latest survey I could find, I'm sure it's way worse than this now. But back in 2008, 59%, almost six out of 10 Christians, people that identified themselves as Christians now, said that they really didn't believe that there was any such thing as a literal devil. 59% in 2008 
of 1,800 and I think it was 36 people, Christians that were polled. Now, they were, they were self-described Christians, you know. I mean, they, they said, hey, I'm a believer and I'm a Christian. And so they asked them the questions and they responded to them. And 59% of those 1,800 people, that's a big poll, by the way, um, said that they did not believe in a literal devil. Now that just simply means that they think somehow that evil, that the devil is a representation of evil or that you know that's just a figure that's used for evil or so forth. And I just wanted you to read, I just wanted to read those scriptures to you because uh, I think you can clearly see that the Bible believes there's a devil. And is the, is the Bible a valid book? And by valid, I mean, is it true? Can we trust it? Well, if we can't trust what the Bible says about the devil, then how could we trust what it says about Jesus? And if we can't believe that what the Bible says about hell, then how could we trust the Bible uh, in what it says about heaven? So I'm just telling you that there is a real devil <laughs> and there is a real hell. There are many, many denominations in America who don't believe there's a hell. Some of them are pretty big denominations. And so, in other words, we, we, we have an enemy that we face that the Bible tells us about. And one of the major problems that we have as Christians in facing the enemy is that many of us don't even believe he exists. And boy, that'd be a real, you know, that'd be a handy feature for an enemy, wouldn't it? For us not even, to, for you not to be ready to fight him or prepared to withstand him because <laughs> somehow you don't even believe that, he's, that he exists in life. And so what I, what I want to do is uh, just start with these names and, and we'll take one each week and we'll look. All right, first of all, and we'll just start in the beginning. We have to know where the devil came from. And I know many of you that have been ch in church all your life, you're aware of who the devil is. There are only three angels that are mentioned by name in the Bible. One of them is Michael. And he's, the, he's the, uh, the warring angel. He's the one that protects Israel. He's the one that came down and destroyed all the Philistines. I mean, he's the, he's, the, he's the angel that seemingly has been given guardianship over the nation of Israel. He's Michael, the archangel. And then there's Gabriel that brought the message to Mary and, and is the messenger angel. He comes and he speaks and, and he, uh, he, he brings the tidings of the Lord and so forth. And then the third angel is Lucifer. Lucifer's name is only mentioned one time in the Bible. I, I'm not sure you might have been aware of that. But Lucifer, the name, is only mentioned one time, and we'll read it in just a moment. But, but uh, Lucifer was the anointed cherub, is what the Bible says, that covers, that covers what? That covers the throne. Uh, Lucifer was built by God, and you'll see it, we'll read it out of Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. And he was built by God to lead worship in heaven. So as, as he would lead the, the rest of the angels in worshiping the Lord, he was built. He had instruments built into his body. He was beautiful. He had a wonderful voice and he covered the throne of God with anointing and led the legions in worship to, to God. And um, one day something happened. Let's just read it in Isaiah 14. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? By the way, Lucifer means uh, morning star or light bearer. So how did you fall from heaven, O oh light bearer? How, do you, how, uh, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven and I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'll be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest pit depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble? Who shook kingdoms? Who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities? Who did not open the house of his prisoners? So one of these days, Lucifer's gonna, we're gonna look at Lucifer, and I know this is one of the things the book of Revelation teaches for sure. But one of these days, all the nations of the earth will see him in his cast down uh, glory, so to speak. And the only thing we're going to wonder is, 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 is that him? That little scrawny, dried up, runt looking something? That, I mean, that, that's the guy that shook the world? I mean, you know, God, come on, man. He got to be kidding about that. So he fell all the way from being a worship leader in heaven because of pride, obviously, 
And, it, and he fell all the way down to being the enemy of God on this earth. Now let's read uh, Ezekiel 28. It talks about Lucifer also. It tells you how he was built and all of that. All right, beginning at, at verse 12, chapter 28, Ezekiel. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Timbrels are tambourines and pipes are wind instruments. So in other words, Lucifer gets built with instruments inside himself. It was peril on the day that, that you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. That's stars, by the way. You were perfect in your ways from the days that you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your merchandise. Yeah. The merchandise is all of the gifts that he was given in order to lead the worship. His beautiful body, his beautiful voice, his beautiful instruments. By the, by the abundance of, of all of the gifts God gave you, is what he's literally saying. Uh, you became filled with violence within. And you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. And I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. So Lucifer was beautiful. He was perfect. He was powerful and he was persuasive because Revelation 2 tells us that when Lucifer fell, one third of the angels in heaven went with him. I mean, imagine that, and I've said this to you before, but imagine this, in the presence of God, God the Father's there, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the majesty and beauty of heaven, all of the angels, all of the glory of what, everything that the Bible tells us about, that heaven is and even more. Lucifer rebels against God because of pride, his beauty. Isn't it funny that he used the very thing that God had given him to rebel against God? That's an awkward thing, but that happens all the time. How much can God bless you and you not use it against him? But Lucifer was beautiful and wonderful and persuasive because in the presence of all that majesty, the angels, one third of the angels in heaven looked at Lucifer and looked at the beauty of heaven and God the Father, God the Son, Holy Spirit, and said, you know, I think I'll go with you. Very persuasive in, in, in his, in his, in his uh, creation. So obviously the number one problem that, of Lucifer was the problem of pride. And, and the number one way that the devil attacks us is pride. Pride has been one of his major tools from the very beginning. And he uses against us, and I know that all of us have to fight pride every day. What does the Bible, you know, a lot of times we, we sit here, we think in pride, we see pride on a list of sins in the Bible or works of the flesh. And we, you know, we look at the other things like murders and adulteries and, and, and treason and treachery and deceit. No, I mean, we look at all of the others and we see pride sitting in the middle of it. And we're, we're prone to say, you know, pride, man, what's pride doing in a list? Like, I mean, you know, a little pride. I mean, come on, you know. I mean, and we treat it so casually is what I'm trying to say. And of course, that's a wonderful thing. It really helps the enemy that you don't think very much about it or you don't think it's a very big deal in your life. But it really is. It's a tremendous deal in our lives. What does the Bible have to say about pride? Well, first thing it says is that pride was how the devil deceived Adam and Eve to rebel against God. And it worked really well. And by the way, that's why he keeps using it. Because it, it, it's a, it, he's proven it to be a, a wonderful tool 
for uh, bringing us into bondage is basically what happens. Look at Genesis chapter three. Here's, here's, here's the encounter. First encounter now, first encounter that, that the devil who's, who was Lucifer, who got cast out of heaven, cast down to earth, became the devil, who became Satan, you know, uh, here on earth, his first encounter with humanity. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God, has God really said to you that you can't eat of any of the trees in this garden? Did he really? I mean, how selfish could God be? You mean he said he created you and he put you here and then he said, don't you eat any of those trees, uh, eat from any of those trees. And then Eve, the woman said to the serpent, well, we, we can eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the, in the, in the middle of the garden out there, that's the one, that tree right there is the one God said, don't, don't eat of that tree. You can, you can eat all of these out here, but don't eat that one. And don't even touch it. And, and I'm sure that's something Adam added in. Uh, you may not be aware, but uh, when God gave the command not to eat of the tree, Eve wasn't even created yet. So uh, Adam had to tell her what God said. And I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, out loud now, I'm just thinking he probably said to her, you know, don't you eat, God said, don't eat of that tree right out there. And then knowing how she is, he said, oh, and don't even touch it. I mean, yeah. Yeah, you don't even touch it. So she tells Satan, nah, you can't touch it and you can't eat it. And then the serpent, now look at here. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, Satan looks at Eve and he says, what did God tell you? Well, he said, don't eat of that tree out there because if we do, we're gonna die. And Satan says, what? That's the silliest thing I've ever heard in my life. You're gonna die if you eat of the tree out there? No, you're not gonna die. Shoot, no, man, God didn't create you to kill you. He's not gonna kill you. Look, God just knows that if you go out there and eat of that tree, that you're gonna become like him. And God is so, and God is so uh, 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 insecure in his life. He, he, he's so uh, petrified that somebody might be like him. Uh, God's just a big bully up there and he just doesn't want you to enjoy life. He doesn't want you to have a good paradise. And so he just told you that so you wouldn't mess with that tree out there. But if you eat of it, you're not gonna die. So Satan's here the first, in the first uh, situation with mankind. He says, God is a liar and a bully. And if you really want to be like God, now imagine this, the devil is looking at her and saying, if you'll sin, you'll be, you'll be like God. I mean, really, you eat of that fruit, you'll be like God. You can be your own God. You won't have to submit to anybody. God told you don't eat. What right does he have to tell you not to do anything? You can do anything you want to do. You don't have to obey him. If you'll just eat that fruit out there, I'll guarantee you, you'll become a God like him and then, and then you don't have to bow down to anybody. Pride. You hear the hiss of that? Yeah, yeah. So Satan is, Satan is using pride. If you just won't, you won't be so um, uh, tight on the rules, you won't, uh, uh, you, you won't take this uh, Christianity too far. Uh, uh, you know, you, you, you just loosen up a little bit and, and not take this stuff about the, what the Bible says about sin. Just loosen up a little bit and, and you'll have a lot more fun in life. That's how the devil uses it. I guess the second thing the Bible says about pride is that God hates it. Not only does God hate pride, he resists it. He actively resists it. Now, I didn't say God hated people. God loves people, right? He does, and he's proven it. If he didn't love us, <laughs> we wouldn't be here. I mean, because we've all given God many reasons not to leave us around here, right? Does the term crispy critter mean anything to you? <laughs> yeah. So God doesn't hate people. God loves people. And God even loves prideful people. But God hates pride. Look in Proverbs 6. 
Whew. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises, devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. These seven things, these six things the Lord hates, and yea, the seven things are an abomination to God. And notice the first one on the list is a proud look. Literally, haughty eyes. We've all seen them, I know, right? As a matter of fact, we've probably all done it before. You know that look, that, uh, that self-satisfied, uh, prideful look that we're the man, we did it. You know, that slight tilt of the head, those eyes that just kind of glisten a little and that little smirky tip of the nose. God says, I hate pride. It's actually an abomination to me. And, and the reason God hates pride is because he knows where it leads. You know where pride, pride leads? It leads us to two places. One, to reject God, and second, to destroy ourselves. Pride is an abominable thing, he says. That means, that means a detestable thing. And all rebellion starts from pride. So God hates pride because pride destroys us. And I'll tell you what God does against pride. God actively resists pride. Let me show you what resist means, James 4. In James 4, verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Resist is a military term. Ante teso. I know you'll remember that. But it's a military term. And what it, what it means is, is it, it represents a battalion of soldiers that are sent out to resist a, a, a single enemy. In other words, it's overwhelming force. It's way more than is necessary. And James says, you know what God does? When you are proud in your life, God sends out a battalion against you and uses overwhelming force to resist you. Now look, God, God, what that's saying is God doesn't fight pride like, resist pride like this. That, that, that's not how God resists pride. Here's how God resists pride, just like that. Because pride is such a, an abominable thing and God does that so that, that we can't be successful in our rebellion against him because he loves us too much to sit around and watch us reject him and to destroy our own life. You know, many of the things in life, I, I know uh, many times when things start going bad or you know, I'm struggling with something and it just seems like it, it's just not working out and it's so frustrating, so aggravating and so annoying and I want to look at that thing and say, I rebuke you devil in the name of Jesus. And then hear God say back, this ain't the devil. This is me. This is a resistance now because that pride is going to lead you in the wrong direction. Now, third thing the Bible says about pride is pride exposes us to spiritual attacks and it negates our authority, our spiritual authority. So when, we, when, when we're filled with pride, that pride opens us up to be attacked by the enemy. And not only does it open us up to be attacked by the enemy, it also takes away any authority that the spiritual authority that God gives us to rebuke and withstand and, and, and withhold the enemy. Let me, let me just show it to you. It's in James chapter four. We read the first uh, verse six. Let me read about four or five verses after that. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. What do we have to do first? We have to first submit ourselves to God. Then we can resist the devil. And then we'll have authority over him. He'll flee from us. He'll, he'll move away. 
because of our authority with God that God has given us. Draw near, the next verse, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Why would God say draw near to him? Because we're not as near to him as we think we are. <laughs> you know, I've heard people say this before, say, look, I can't get any closer to God. Jesus is living in my heart and I can't get any closer than that. And I'm saying, you're ridiculous. If you couldn't get any closer to him, why did God say you could get closer to him? Why did he say, if you'll draw near to me, I'll draw near to you? And the reason is because we're not near as close to him most of the time as we think we are. Then he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. That deals with your methods. That deals with the way you do things. Can, let me ask you this. Can you have good methods and a bad heart? Yeah. Can you have a bad heart and good methods? Can you have good, bad methods and a good heart? Sure you can. So he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy turned to gloom. <laughs> I can see that really pumps you up. Uh, <laughs> you mean I'm supposed to be happy when, when I weep and mourn and my laughter's turned to mourning and my joy's turned to gloom? What he's talking about here is he's saying, now look, if you see yourself the way you really are, you're not going to be happy about it. If you see the way you really are, you're going to be gloomy. You're going to be, your laughter is going to turn to, to, to mourning and, and, you, and your happiness is going to turn to sad. He's talking about seeing yourself the way you really are and recognizing how much you need God and how, much, and how you can give yourself to the Lord in your life. That's what he's talking about. And then this last, humble yourself, verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. I know I've heard people say before and pray before, Lord, humble me. I don't want to be filled with pride. So you may be looking at something today and after today's message, you may say, you know, that pride is a lot worse than I thought it was. So I'm on just, I don't want to be prideful. So Lord, I, uh, Lord, humble me. I mean, I, I want to be humbled. And, I, Lord, I, uh, and, and, and he's going to look back at you and what he's going to say, he said, that, it's not my job to humble you. It's your job to humble yourself. I'm not going to humble you. Come on, God. I, you got to humble me, man. I don't know how to humble myself. And if, and if you force God's hand, what God's going to do, he's not going to humble you. He's going to humiliate you. Right. And then you'll humble yourself, you know. So, so, so you get the triple whammy. If you don't submit yourself, you, you get the trifecta. God resists you. The devil attacks you and you don't have any authority in life. Let me give you one more observation. This is it. The answer for pride is worship. Now, I know that most of the time when you think, all right, the answer for pride would be what? Humility. If I, if, if I don't want pride to rule in my life, then I, just, I need to be humble. But I submit to you that it's more than just simply being humble. I'm saying it's worship. Lucifer fell all the way from leading worship what is worship? It's, it's adoration. It, it's not just simply bowing. It's adoring someone. It, it, it's, 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 it's elevating his worth, you know, putting him on a pedestal, uh, bragging about his worth. I mean, it's much more than just simply being humble in life. So the answer for pride, you say, how do I deal with pride? And what can I do with pride? The answer to that is worship. Lucifer went from leading worship in heaven to leading a rebellion against God on the earth. So pride then is a seedbed for all of the sins that can manifest themselves out of our life. So let me give you three practical reasons real quick why we worship God. Why should we worship God? Three reasons. Number one, to keep our lives God-centered and not me-centered. It's easy for our lives to become me-centered, isn't it? Right? You know, I've told Tanya, I think, did I say this this morning or did I say it last night? I said, you know, a lot of people worry all the time about what people think about them. You may be one of those that worry all the time about what people are thinking about you. Let me just say to you, people aren't thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. People don't sit at home and... And think about you. 
Well, oh, did you see that? She looked so raggedy today. That was such a nasty dress she had on. That was, no, it's, it was, how did I look today? Uh, what did so-and-so say to me today? What, you know, I mean, no, we, we, we worry about ourselves. So when I say to you that, our, that, that we have a responsibility to keep our lives God-centered and not me-centered, I'm talking about a pretty big project here. Let me read you what King David said um, uh, about worshiping God. He's reminding himself. This is David in the book of Psalms, and he's reminding himself of everything that God means to him. Look at this, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all of our iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Boy, I could stand that. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. That's, by the way, uh, all the way apart. I don't know if you're very geographical in life, but just to show you what that means, uh, if you, you can, north and south run into each other. On the globe, if you start heading north, then you get to the top, then you're gonna be heading south. North, south, north, south. East and west, if you start east, you'll always be east. If you said west, you always be west. So what that's saying is that God has removed our sins so far from us that we will never see them again. He has done that. He's thrown them in the deepest part of the ocean and posted a no fishing sign. You'll never see them again. This is what God is. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. This is praise. This is, this is, this is worship to God. This is reminding yourself of what, of what God is to you. And what David is saying here is, David is saying, you know what God is to me? God is everything to me. He's my father, he's my friend, he's my provider. I mean, God is my healer, my protector, my righteousness. God is everything to me. Again, David, in Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Let me ask you a question. And don't really answer because this is rhetorical because when you answer, I really know what you're going to say and then when I say something else, it's going to embarrass you and I don't want you to be embarrassed. <laughs> I'm not trying to trick you. But, but here's a question. When we worship the Lord, and don't answer it now, <laughs> when we worship the Lord, does God get bigger? Oh, magnify the Lord with me. When we worship the Lord, does God get bigger? And the answer is no. God doesn't get bigger. I mean, when you are omnipresent, you know what that means? You're everywhere. And you can't get any bigger than everywhere. When you worship, God gets bigger to you. He magnifies in your life. Worship magnifies the Lord. No worship minimizes the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I need a bigger God and a smaller devil. And when I worship the Lord, God gets bigger and bigger and bigger in my life and in my heart and in my mind, and the devil gets smaller and smaller and smaller in my heart and in my spirit and in my mind. And I walk, all, I walk around all day with a great big God and a little bitty devil, and that makes a lot of difference to me. Now, what keeps you God-centered is worship. We worship God to keep ourselves straight in the fact that we worship him and he is everything to us. Here's a second reason 
to keep our faith in God strong and active. Here comes David again. <laughs> Psalm 16, look. I have set the Lord always before me. All right. David said, I, God is always before me. I have set him there. And because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my joy rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. How do, how, how do you set the Lord always before you? How, how would you do that? Well, praise would, would, would be one instrument, right? Yeah, Pray, prayer might be an instrument where we could set the Lord before us. Meditating on the word of God, that, that, we could set him before us like that. Worship, you know, we could set the Lord. David says, look, I keep on remembering. You know what I keep on remembering? In all, of my, in all of my life, everywhere I'm going, everything I'm doing, all that's happening around me, you know what I keep remembering? I keep remembering that God is with me. Is God with us? Well, Jesus said where two or three are gathered in his name, there I am in the midst of you. Jesus told us that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit resides on the inside of us when we come to Christ. And so God is always with me, right? Every day that you go through life, you see people, you run into people, you run into circumstances, you run into problems, you run into issues, and you run into challenges, and there are lots of, lots of struggles in life, right? Well, if you don't set the Lord before you, it's just you and them. It's you and the problems, you and the circumstances, you and the issues, you and the challenges, but if you set the Lord before you, everything you see is filtered through God. You know, David was a, was a shepherd boy, right? When God called him to be the king of Israel and sent Samuel to anoint him, he was out in the field keep, keeping sheep, right? Well, they called him in and anointed him. Then they sent him right back out there to feed the sheep. And as he got a little bit older, Israel went to battle with the Philistines. And the Philistines had this champion, big old nine foot something giant named Goliath. And David's father said, David, go up to the battlefield and check on your brothers and take these few snacks up here and take them up there and see how everything's going. And so as David approaches the camp, about the same time, here, here comes Goliath in his daily diatribe of insulting God and insulting the warriors of Israel. And as it, Goliath is down there insulting, cursing God, and, and challenging all of the trained soldiers of Israel all of the trained fighting men, warriors of Israel are standing on the top looking down in the valley shivered in their boots. And a little shepherd boy that's barely a teenager hears Goliath's words and he walks over to the edge of the cliff and he looks down and he sees all of the trained warriors of Israel shaking in their boots. And David, remember David is a worshiper and remember what David said, I keep the Lord always before me. And so here he goes up to the king and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would say those evil things about God? And then he goes to Saul and he's, he asks Saul's permission to go down there and kill the infidel. And Saul says, well, if you're going to go down there, you need to take this armor. And he tries to put his armor on David and, and David tries it out and he says, no, 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 no. This is what won't work for me. All I need is this little sling and this rock. That's all I need. And I'm sure Saul is probably thinking, well... I probably need to let the kid go because, I mean, even if Goliath kills him, maybe it'll be an encouragement to everybody. I, you know. And he said, all right, go ahead. And when David gets to the edge of the cliff, remember, David is a worshiper. And remember that David said, I keep the Lord always before me. Every giant I see, I see it through the filter of God. Every problem I see, I see it through the filter of God. It's not just me and the problem. It's, it's me and God and the problem. 
And as he walks over to the edge of the hill, Goliath is down there really being insulted. I mean, Goliath is down there pouting because he, when he, he looks up there and he sees a little shepherd boy and he sees a stick in his hand, which was a staff. He didn't see the sling, but he, he saw the stick in his hand, which was just a little stick staff. And he gets insulted. And David takes off running toward him. And as David is running toward Goliath, Goliath is saying, am I a dog? Man, you insulted me. You're sending a kid down here with a stick. My soul, man. And he gets all insulted about that and David is running straight at him. And, 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 and David, here's what David is saying. Because the Lord is always before him. David said, you come to me with a sword and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the living God. And God is going to give you into my hand today and I'm going to cut your head off and I'm going to feed it to the birds. Now, that's a kid with an attitude. And where did he get that attitude? Was it pride that gave him the attitude? No. He didn't say, I'm coming to you in my name. I'm going to kill you. What did he say? He said, I'm coming to you in the name of the living God. And he's going to give me into your hand. So David realizes, hey, God can do anything. And I, it's not about me. It's about, it, it, it's about God. I'm a worshiper, and, and, and I keep reminding myself that wherever I go and whoever I see and whatever circumstance I face in life, God, God is, I have a big God, and my big God is always with me. Do you know what pride is? Pride is an, a, is a, is an inordinate consideration of yourself. Mm. You think more highly of yourself than you should. The number one problem with depression, the number one cause of depression, we are told by psychologists, psychiatrists, and so forth, is thinking too much about yourself. Just having too much time, <laughs> focusing too much on yourself. The scripture teaches us that pride is gonna fail. Proverbs says, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. Pride's gonna fail. When pride fails, and we don't have the Lord before us, what's gonna happen to us? We're gonna fall into depression, right? Stress, anxiety. In the song, you know, I just wanna say, I just wanna speak the name of Jesus to all the anxiety, you remember the words? To all the depression. I wanna speak it over my family. Because, because pride is a weapon of the enemy and, and it's easy for us to fall into depression and stress and anxiety because we focus too much on ourselves. Look at, look at Isaiah 61. This is talking about the Lord and why he came and what he's gonna come and do and so forth. And this is just, uh, just a couple of verses here. To console, this is why Jesus is coming, according to Isaiah. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and look at this, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Now, I underline a word there because I wanted to make sure that you saw it. You see the word that I'm talking about? All right, what is heaviness? Heaviness is darkness. Heaviness is depression. Heaviness is anxiety. Heaviness is stress. And what does the scripture say that, the, that, that heaviness is? Is it an emotion? No, the Bible says that it's a spirit, right? He's gonna give us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Look at 2 Timothy 1. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Fear is not an emotion. Fear is a spirit. If you treat fear like fear is an emotion, you will never overcome fear. Fear is a spirit that Satan attaches to an emotion in your life in order to, in order to encourage you to make poor decisions so that God can't bless your decisions. 
I don't know about you, but here's what I found out about my life. Every decision that I have ever made that was motivated by fear, it's been the wrong decision. We can't wait on the house. Somebody else will get it. I got to have that car over there because it's just the right one. You're afraid. You're afraid you're going to lose it. You're afraid it won't be there when you come back. You're afraid something else is going to happen to it. Your decisions are made with fear. And what happens? You can't pay the notes. The thing's a piece of junk. I mean, God had something for you if you'd have been patient enough to wait on God. But you make decisions out of fear. Fear is a spirit. Depression will swallow you up. Depression is like a blanket of self that just surrounds itself. And what, is, and what does the Bible say? That God has given us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. When heaviness is kind of coming at you, start praising. When fear is coming at you, don't take a Xanax, you know, or, or one of those other ones, which I can't think of at the moment. <laughs> no, you know the ones I'm talking about. Don't pop a pill. Begin to praise. The spirit, the garment of praise. Well, hey, look, when God says it's, that something's a garment, what he wants you to, to see about that is that it means it's something that you have to put on. Yeah, it means you're not born with it. It means, you know, you don't wake up every morning with it on you. You got to put it on. And so he said, hey, every morning when you get up, you, you, man, you put, on the, you put on the garment of praise and that spirit of heaviness. What will happen? The spirit of heaviness will just move away from you because the Bible says that God is enthroned on the praises of his people. And Satan and God can't coexist in the same place. So if God is there, guess who isn't going to be there? The devil. It's a weapon. David said, I have set the Lord always before me. Therefore, my heart is glad. My joy rejoices. Why am I glad? Because I'm just sitting here thinking about him. What happens when I quit thinking about him and start thinking about myself? I get depressed. I get discouraged. I get overwhelmed. I get anxious. Whew. It's a terrible thing. And the last thing he said, he said, my flesh will, shall rest in hope. As opposed to what? As opposed to anxiety. <laughs> yeah, depression, discouragement, overwhelm. You know, we're living in difficult days. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. Have you noticed that? <laughs> These days we're in are bad and tough. And they're scary. And they're overwhelming. Right? I'll guarantee you, watch the news every night. You are going to be fearful, depressed, anxious, overwhelmed, discouraged, and everything else in life. Because these are some hard days. But though they're hard days, they're his days. God is in control of these days. The devil's not in control of these days. The Antichrist is not in control of these days. God is in control of these days. And God is big enough to handle all of that stuff. And so when I praise him, when I remind myself of him, it elevates me. It keeps my faith alive and working not sitting in some corner, dusted off somewhere, and I only bring it out when, when something horrible happens. No, our faith is intended to be used every, every day. So put on the garment of praise. All right, let me give you the, the third one here. Why do, we, why do we worship the Lord? To keep everything in its correct perspective. Without, without keeping things in the correct, without worshiping, keeping things in the correct perspective, you know what will happen to us? We'll turn in on ourselves. Everything will be about me. Me, my. Oh yeah, me, me, birds. <laughs> me did this, me did that, me has this, me has that. An example? Look at the last verse of the Lord's Prayer. Have you ever noticed it? The last verse of the Lord's Prayer is in Matthew 6, it's verse 13. Look at the prayer. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, literally the evil one. For yours is the kingdom. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna stress that in the next one. And yours is the power. And yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Or if you're Methodist, Presbyterian, amen. Evangel you know what this is called? It's called an acknowledgement of divine right. That sounds sophisticated, doesn't it? An acknowledgement of divine right. What does that mean? Well, let me ask you this. Do you know, are you aware that you don't have any glory? When you wake up every day and you lay this before the Lord and you come to that last line and you say, and Lord, don't let me fall into temptation today and deliver me from evil. Let me see it coming a mile off, God, and give me the courage to stand up against it. For yours is the kingdom. You know what you're saying to God? I don't have a kingdom. I'm not trying to get a kingdom. I know you're the only one that has a kingdom. And I know I'm going to be in your kingdom because you're the only one that has one. So you're the owner of everything and it's your kingdom. And then you say, yours is the kingdom. And then you say, yours is the power. What are you saying to God? You're saying to God, I don't have power. You know what I've noticed as I, as I get older? I don't even have very much energy anymore. <laughs> so I certainly don't have any power. But you're, you're, you're saying to God, God, I don't, I, uh, I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to try to, uh, to, to steal power from you. God, I'm not going to try to live my life like, like I don't have to trust in you because I don't have the power to defeat the devil. I don't have the power to live like I should because it, you, it's your power. And then he says, uh, your, yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory forever. God, I don't deserve your glory. I know it's wrong for me to live my life trying to make myself look good. Anything that's good in me came from you. When people compliment me and say, I enjoyed that, or you look nice today, or whatever, I say, look, anything good about me, God gave it to me. God put it in me. All of those gifts that, you, that people admire, all of, God, God is responsible for all of that. God, I don't want to steal any of your glory. I don't want to rob any of your glory. Every glory in my life is yours because it's your glory and, it, and it's not mine. Remember that Lucifer, what was his problem? He wanted to steal God's glory. He wanted God's glory. He wanted to be bigger than God, higher than God. Let me show you something about these days that we're living in and I'm finished. These are some tough days, we all know it. How many of you feel, just, 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 taking just a little survey here, I'm not gonna hold you to it, but how many of you feel like we're in the last days? You feel like all of this evil and violence and all of this has been told us by God and that we're seeing it unfold every day on TV and everywhere else. I believe every spiritual person believe, uh, has a sense of this anyway. Let me just say that. Now, I don't know how long it is before the end. I mean, it could be one week. It could be one year. It could be 10 years. It could be, but we're in those days of countdown because I can't imagine it getting a whole lot worse than this, to be honest with you. So let me speak to you just a second about these last days. But, and, and, and this has a point. And remember that Lucifer's problem was he wanted God's glory. He wanted to steal God's glory. Well, one day there's coming someone on this earth that's going to steal the glory of God. And he's going to be Lucifer reborn, Lucifer 2.0. He's going to be called the Antichrist. But he's going to be the incarnation of Satan, Lucifer. And Lucifer is going to get what he finally has wanted all of his existence. He's going to get God's glory on this earth. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. So before the last days, there's going to be a great falling away from God. I don't, know about, I don't know if you've noticed this, but everybody's religion is fine except for Christians. Everybody's accepted except for Christians. Christians are, are evidently uh, 
the most disrespectful people on the face of the earth. We obviously should be uh, disclaimed by every government agency and every person on this earth because we're somehow looked at as evil. Don't be deceived. This stuff is not going to happen unless the, there comes a falling away first and the man of sin is revealed. The son of perdition. That's the devil himself. That's Lucifer incarnate. That means the Antichrist is the reincarnation of devil. Verse four, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So Lucifer's finally now gonna get what he's wanted all this time and the reason that he will have so many followers in that day is because in these days that we're living in, even though he has not been exposed to us yet, we're living in a, in a pre-exposure rebellion is basically what it boils down. We're living in the, in the twilight of something that's just about to come. And let me just show you, I've quoted this, this verse, these two or three verses, several times with just little pieces of them, but let me just read to you what that day is gonna be. Just look at this. This is 2 Timothy 3. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. You know what perilous means? It means there's no answer. In the last days, there are gonna be things happening on this earth that there's no answer for. I don't know about you, but I look at some of this junk going on right now and I'm thinking, man, what would you have to do to stop that myth? Or how's that gonna be undone? People and things and, oh, anyway. For men, second verse, for men will be lovers of themselves. Does that pretty much describe it? Lovers of money. If you wanna know what's wrong, follow the money. Boasters, proud, blasphemers. Look at this one, disobedient to parents. How did that get into this? Disobedient to parents? That's one of those Bible school things, ain't it? Oh, it means, it means rebelling against parents. I'll guarantee you, you go to any of these places where these riots, riots are going on, and I'm not talking about protesters, I'm talking about rioters, I'm talking about anarchists. You go to any one of them, I bet you, well, I better not bet, that's not a Christian thing to do. <laughs> How can I say this? I guarantee you that you won't find one of those rioters that has anything but contempt for their father. I bet you can't find one of them that loves their father. Disobedient to parents. Rebellious against parents. without, uh, 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 unthankful, unholy, unthankful. Man, if you, if you, what's the spirit of that stuff? I don't, I, I don't get what I got. I don't get what I deserve. Everybody else gets what they deserve. I need, I, unthankful. Live in the greatest land in the face of the world. Live in the greatest country that's ever been. And you can't be thankful for that? Unthankful unholy, unloving, unforgiving. That's one of the big problems we have right now. I don't care what you say, you can't be forgiven anything. You did something 25 years ago that you shouldn't have done. You know you shouldn't have done it. It was bad. And you get on national TV and apologize and repent and say, man, I made a mistake. I did it wrong and please forgive me. They're not going to forgive you. They're not going to ever forget it. And they're going to bring it up every time they talk about you. You can't get any forgiveness for anything. Unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. Everything that's good is despised and everything that's bad is admired. Traitors. Burning the flag, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. 
In other words, they may look like they're Christians, but they aren't. From such people turn away. As God's people, we're called to be worshipers, turned away from pride, pursuing humility. Even in a world like this, pride's a battle. It's an abomination to God, and we all have to deal with it. And James said, if we'll just humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, that he'll lift us up, and if we'll submit ourselves to God, then resist the devil, you'll have authority over the devil. You don't have authority, listen, you don't have authority over the devil if you are walking in the same direction he's walking in. The only way you defeat a spirit is by another spirit by a greater spirit. I, I, that's, why, that's why God says, love your enemies. I've heard people say, well, I don't love my enemies. I hate my enemies. I'm gonna fight fire with fire. That's what I'm gonna do. Well, let me tell you what you're gonna get, a bigger fire. The only way you overcome one spirit is by an opposing spirit. And so when you're dealing with pride, how do you deal with it? You deal with it with worship. You deal with it with humility. It's all about God and not about me. Lucifer. Pride. All right, bow your head with me.